Okay, we are ready to get into it. A um, couple of things. Um, be brilliant and be brief, okay, because we've got uh, a lot of people that we'd like to hear from. So uh, uh, we're going to start uh, the state of distracted driving uh, with Nicole Hood uh, with the uh, Missouri Depart uh, State uh, Highway Administration, uh, Captain John Hotz with the Missouri Highway Patrol, and Susan DeCourcy, who's with uh, NHTSA Region 7 Administrator. So Nicole, you've got some statistics for us. We've heard a number of them, but uh, let's, uh, let's get into it. Okay, so yes, I have some data and some numbers for us today. Good morning. So we do have a lot of work to do when it comes to improving highway safety in Missouri. Highway crashes are a leading cause of death in Missouri, and crashes for teens, they're the number one killer. 921 people lost their lives on Missouri roads in 2018, and as we've all discussed, the majority of those were preventable. In 2018, there were at least 79 fatalities with regards to distracted driving, over 19,000 total crashes, 564 of those were serious injuries, and over 7,000 were property damage only or minor injuries. And we all know that so many of those go unreported, so you know I said at least 79 fatalities. Since 2014, cell phone related crashes in Missouri have increased by 35% with nearly 2,600 crashes in 2017. And we're on pace again. We don't have our final results for 2018, but we're pretty much on pace with those same numbers. Distracted driving, it's not just a younger driver problem. Approximately 70% of drivers using cell phones in Missouri traffic crashes were 22 years of age or older. Missouri is one of two states, as we've already heard, without a no texting law for all drivers and one of nine states without a hands-free law for either all drivers or novice drivers. As some of you might recall, during the summer of 2017, the National Safety Council released a state of safety report and it shared a national snapshot of state rankings. Missouri received a letter grade F. We were one of 11 states to receive a letter grade F. I would hope no one in this room would want to receive a letter grade F. This report recommends policy actions that can help states save lives, and it's about legislation. It reminds us that we must never become complacent regarding traffic safety laws and their benefits to Missourians and our state's visitors. One of the many areas that we were considered off-track status was with regards to distracted driving. MoDOT is trying to change distracted driving in Missouri through education, such as our Buckle Up, Phone Down came, campaign that Director McKenna mentioned. Um, we're continuing to see progress in this area, especially with regards to seat belts, but it's hard to track the progress for distracted driving. And one of our commission's legislative priorities for the past several years has been trying to strengthen our no texting law. This is a proven lifesaver that MoDOT supports, however, it just continues to fail in legislature. The only legislation that we do have related to distracted driving in Missouri is a texting ban for those that are 21 years of age or under. But we've heard time and time again from enforcement that it's hard to enforce the law that's with regards to a certain age group. We have nine cities in the state of Missouri who have taken the initiative on their own to enact public policy by passing an ordinance for an all driver texting ban. And we actually have two cities that have taken the initiative to pass an all driver distracted driving ordinance. Columbia is one of those that, and they're here with us today. With regards to pedestrians, 130 of the distracted driving crashes that I mentioned earlier involved a pedestrian. Last year we had five pedestrians that were killed that were involved in distracted driving and this year we're on pace with that again. In 2018, 13 people were killed in work zone crashes in Missouri. Since 2014, we've had 54 lives that have been taken. And when you start looking at the statistics and the results of those crashes, we're continuing to see that those crashes are occurring on straight, flat roads during the daytime. Just to give you an example, 84% of those crashes were on straight roads. 62% were on level and 70% on daytime. So what does that tell us? It tells us that distracted driving is a major issue in this state and all across the nation. I'll end with that. Thank you. Um, a famous person once said that uh, one person's death is a tragedy. Thousands are statistic. The challenge here is to get beyond the statistics. We've all heard the statistics. 
these are tragedies multiplied times over. And you know, I, I think the point is, is made clearly. Um, Captain Hotz, what are your observations relative? Uh, you're oftentimes uh, the second one to the scene of the accident, and, uh, excuse me, the crash. And uh, uh, tell us uh, your view from the uh, State Highway Patrol position. Well, certainly our, our view comes from a variety of, of different uh, points. Uh, obviously, we work the traffic crashes that uh, are the result of the uh, distracted drivers. Uh, we also do a lot of enforcement to try to prevent this. Uh, in addition to enforcement, we do education. Uh, so we do a variety of things to try and limit the number of people that are injured or killed in these crashes. Uh, unfortunately, we, we see those numbers continue to, to go up. And, I've been around for 30 years now, so that means I've seen kind of the evolution of distraction. Uh, when I first started, there wasn't such a thing as cell phones. Uh, so we had people that were distracted by other people in the car, uh, just in the radio, uh, eating, drinking, um, combing their hair, shaving, you know, those, those types of things. So now it's, it's so much easier, I think, for people to be distracted because we have so many more devices out there. Uh, we also have a, a craving to be instantly connected with everything else in the world. And unfortunately, that carries over to uh, when we're driving as well. Um, and we know driving is a full-time job. And any time that we're doing something else, um, that's taking away from our, our primary function there. Uh, we, we had a news conference here in uh, Columbia uh, several years ago at the uh, hospital. And a neurosurgeon there kind of put it best. A lot of people say that uh, when they drive, they multitask. And he said the reality is, is you're not multitasking. You are doing a sequence of tasks, uh, you know, basically in a row. So even though you think you are texting and driving, uh, when you're texting, you're really just texting. Now, you're sitting behind a wheel of a car going 55 or 65 or 70 miles an hour, but our focus is on that text, right? and we're not seeing all the things that are going on uh, around us. And we know driving in this area or any other area of the state, we get away with texting and driving if everything goes right around us. And unfortunately, as the director said, the reason we don't have more crashes is we're just lucky. Um, if you look at each and every day, how often do people change lanes in front of us? How often do they pull out from a traffic light or not stop at a stop sign or um, you know, turn left when they should be turning right. If we are distracted, we're not going to see those things happen, and we're not going to be able to avoid that traffic crash from happening in the first place. So critically important that not only are we paying attention to what we're doing as we are driving along, but we also got to pay attention to what everybody else is doing around us. And as we know, there are a lot of distracted drivers around us as well. So we have to drive not only for ourselves, but for those other people um, that are out there. So uh, very um, pleased to be part of this board today. Um, we see firsthand the effects of, of traffic crashes. And after we work the crashes, then we go and talk to the family members of those who uh, have been killed. And if you talk to any law enforcement officer, they will tell you that that is without a doubt the very worst part of our job. And it never gets any easier, no matter how many times you do it. So um, thank you for this opportunity, for the efforts. Uh, without a doubt, we have to do something to curb uh, the distracted driving out there on our highways. We are committed to work with anybody that we can to, to help those numbers go down. Obviously, we want that number to be uh, zero as far as the number of people that are injured and killed uh, in these crashes because there is no acceptable number of people who are injured and killed um, on our highway. So, thank you. Thank you, uh, Captain Holtz. Um, I think, you know, one message you are going to hear again and again uh, is that it's up to the people of Missouri to decide what's acceptable. Uh, again, uh, those of us from Washington, the standard joke is, I'm from the government, I'm here to help you. Uh, that doesn't apply here. This is up to you folks to decide. You have, most of the people here are from Missouri. You have the ability to change this if you want to. And I would encourage you to talk to your friends and neighbors and ask them, you know, what, what 
explain to me why you think this is a good thing and how uh, this is more important than keeping people alive. Uh, I'd like next to turn to uh, uh, Susan DeCourcy with uh, NHTSA, Region 7 Administrator. Um, we make a number of recommendations to NHTSA. Sometimes they listen to us and sometimes they have other ideas, but uh, it's, uh, it's always a productive relationship. Uh, Susan, your views. Well, and please speak into the microphone so we can get uh, all of your uh, words where everybody can hear them. Thank you. Because I come from a national perspective, um, you know, we look at uh, the nation as a whole, and in 2017, 37,133 people uh, lost their life on the nation's roadway. With that being said, of those, 3,166 people died as a, as a cause of distraction-affected crashes. That represents about 9% of the fatal crashes. And when you're talking about every single one of those crashes, that is, as been mentioned, a loved one, a family member. And you know, when you look at the numbers in 2016, which were a little higher, so I want to think, well, it's going down. But those are still too many lives being lost. Again, a family member, a friend, a coworker. And when you think about distraction, as was mentioned, there's so many forms of distraction, and I think people think that they have the ability. They have, um, oh, I'm a good driver. I can do this. Well, no, you can't, because when you think about distraction, you're taking away your visual ability, your manual ability, and your cognitive ability. And when you combine those, it sets up for a disastrous ending, as with 3,166 people dying in 2017. So really distraction is anything that takes your eyes, your hands, and your mind off of what you're doing, and that is driving a, a vehicle. And at the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, we work very closely with all of our state partners, our federal partners, to look for ways to encourage campaigns to be started, roundtables such as this, which is going to be a catalyst for partnership so that states can come together or organizations within states, partnerships can be formed so that you can stand together to say, we've got to make a change. And it really is a cult cultural change that needs to occur. Because when you think about crashes, about 94% of the time, it's human behavior that's causing that crash. It is some form of decision, some form of activity that is causing that crash. All preventable, all preventable. If people just stop and think about what they're doing. As Americans, we all love to have a challenge. Whether it's, and you know, the buckle up phone down is a wonderful challenge for schools to get involved with, businesses to get involved with. But if you think about yourself, everybody likes a personal challenge. So challenge yourself. Challenge your friends to say, I can do this. I can drive without having to be glued to my phone. I can be a good driver being visually, manually, and cognitive engaged in driving that vehicle. And our, one of our greatest partners is our law enforcement. <coughs> and getting the message out about the enforcement efforts, the campaigns that we have with NHTSA we've developed, you drive, you text, you pay. So when you think about combining partnerships, law enforcement activities, and public information education, that sets up for a very, very good, effective program. We have our click it or ticket model, which we've been, uh, and the states have been implementing for years, and that has been a combination of effective public information education with strong enforcement, and that has been very effective and has increased the nation's and state's seatbelt use rates. So that kind of model can work also with distraction. I'll leave it at Great. that. Great, thank you. So it's, it's interesting to me that uh, um, click it or ticket, but you can't give tickets here. We'll get into this more in the, in the next, uh, next panel. So before I get into asking all kinds of interesting questions, let me open it up here to the, to the group uh, on, 
what you've heard at this point and what you uh, have to say. remember, use the microphone, get it as close as you can. So, panel? Kevin, State Farm. Yes. You're um, in the insurance business. You guys get to uh, write the big checks, right? <laughs> well, we touch, uh, we touch the issue from uh, many different angles along the lines of what Captain Hunts mentioned, but wanted to add a few quick observations. Please. Um, for eight years, State Farm conducted national surveys of drivers and driving behavior um, and wanted to mention four quick findings from those surveys that might be relevant to this discussion. Um, the first one, um, as was touched on a little bit earlier, um, awareness alone does not determine driving behavior. Um, among those who reported texting while driving in the surveys, nearly 9 in 10 thought texting increased the likelihood of a crash. So even rational awareness of the potential outcomes of your actions alone is not so enough to So we know this is a behavior. bad thing to do. Yes, but we, we know keep this. doing it. Yes. That. Um, another finding um, was essentially that risky driving behaviors travel together, so to speak. Drivers who engaged in more smartphone activity also engaged in other types of risky behavior, um, the very types that Captain Hans mentioned a moment ago. Speeding, DUI, eating, failing to signal turns, not wearing a seat belt, racing, grooming, drowsy driving. And uh, I think this highlights the importance of related laws that complement one another. We talk about um, the importance of a primary seatbelt law, and we can see that related laws can disrupt a pattern of distracted driving behavior. Um, so even laws that may not seem to immediately relate to distracted driving can help disrupt those patterns. Um, the third item, the perception of laws was important in impacting behavior. Uh, those who believed cell phone use was illegal um, were 16% less likely to do it while driving. So whether, whatever the state of the laws, uh, their perception of the legality of an action impacted their behavior in a significant way. And one final point, um, we also conducted surveys of teen drivers specifically. One of our outcomes from that survey was um, teens indicated um, if their parents used cell phones while driving, they were more likely to participate in a, a wide, not just cell phone use, but other types of distracted driving behavior. And so I think that highlights a gap or a flaw in Missouri's current law, if we're allowing adults to participate in distracted driving activities, that's going to have a direct impact on young driver behavior, which is undermining the purpose of the distracted driving law we currently have on the books. So it's a fundamental flaw in uh, Missouri's current approach to that from a legislative standpoint. So that's sort of a uh, do as I say, don't do as I do uh, kind of situation. You know, I. When I learned to drive, uh, the earth had barely cooled at that point, but uh, seat belts were just coming in and our driver's education uh, instructor said, this car doesn't move until everybody is buckled in. And we've been doing, continuing to doing accident investigations at many crashes. In fact, we've made the recommendation on school buses now that they don't just rely on compartmentalization, the high back seats, but that they have three-point shoulder harnesses uh, on, on, on all of them. The point I'm trying to make here is that if you catch people early and you model the behavior, it's going to make a difference. Um, anybody else uh, in terms of thoughts, comments, and so on on the state of distracted driving? Deanna. I would like to recognize MoDOT for coming up with the buckle up phone down and making it a department policy to not use their phones while driving and then encouraging other businesses or challenging other businesses to do the same. I think that with the state taking that role is just a huge impact on the whole state. We're going to talk, uh, I think, in our third panel about uh, corporate regulation. I can tell you right now, uh, the NTSB has a policy that we are not to use our phones while we're uh, behind the wheel. And that, you know, if you got an important call, and sometimes I'm on go team or something like that where we have to be readily available, the deal is you find a place, pull over, and have the conversation or the text. What difference is two or three minutes going to make? Uh, we're not talking about going to nuclear war here, where seconds count. I mean, this is, this is a big thing. Uh, Nicole, going back to statistics, and, and maybe for you, Susan, as well, um, 
my sense is, I'm a data point of one, so I know it's correct, but um, my sense is we're undercounting these things that, that you know, unless the person doing the investigation at, at the scene of the uh, crash knows to ask the question or says, hey, I want to see your phone and we're going to check this out as to whether you were doing it. And of course, I've just put my phone, just tossed it into the back seat. So I said, oh, no, I wouldn't dare think of it. Is your sense the same that this is badly undercounted and that we haven't quite gotten to being able to look at this, uh, and this would also be for our law enforcement uh, partners here to be saying, hey, we really need to start immediately being suspicious of that just as we do DUI. So, Nicole? Yeah, my sense is I totally agree with you. We've heard um, statistics that over 50% of them are underreported. So we would- 50%? That, yes. Those are, those are just research um, data that we've heard over the years. So I would be interested to hear what law enforcement has to say about that. Um, Susan, your observations. I absolutely agree that uh, the actual number that we have is really higher. And I think it boils down to um, issues with observing, reporting, and analyzing of the data that leads to these lower numbers uh, that we have instead of probably the true picture. Okay. Uh, to our law enforcement representatives, uh, your thoughts and observations relative to, uh, um, you know, when you get to the scene of a crash and, and what you're looking for, uh, uh, Officer Eric. Yeah, I think there's not really an incentive to admit to it. If you're in a crash, you know, if you have a DWI incident, we have a lot of clues on our hands. We can smell the odor of alcohol. A lot of driving or after driving behaviors are very indicative of that. There's not really an incentive for someone to be honest with a law enforcement officer. If I walk up to you and I say, have you been using your cell phone today? Were you using it moments before the crash? And I think that's where a lot of the underreporting comes from. Okay. Um, I have read somewhere that uh, uh, somebody is working on a device that can tell law enforcement very quickly whether a cell phone has been uh, used uh, recently. Uh, I don't know if this exists or not, but it would seem like uh, that would be helpful to you. Uh, uh, Sergeant Perkins, any uh, observations from your side? Well, that certainly be a possibility of, you know, technology may be the answer to go to some, some distracted driving stuff. Mm -hmm. Like she mentioned, one of the issues is that at a crash scene is who's going to admit they were on their cell phones, unless you have a witness observing it, or you have to end up getting a search warrant if it's a serious enough crash to go through cell phone records. So in order to check if somebody's been using a cell phone, you have to get a search warrant? That without having their consent, that would be correct. Okay. That's interesting. Jennifer. Well, two points. Um, one, on that, you know, when these crashes were happening back, like when my mom was killed, you could just subpoena the cell phone records and see if they were using their phone. But now with the data transmissions, those don't show up on those records the same. And so they actually have to get the phone and do a forensic analysis. So that requires additional training for the investigators, as well as the cost becomes a lot. And if you know both people were killed in the crash, there may not necessarily be a lawsuit or criminal charges. So the time and the money to be spent on that are, could be limited. And then my other point is on the data. Um, I don't know if it's gone up much by now, but only 32 states even have a checkbox on their crash report for distracted driving crashes. So that's you know 18 states we're not even getting that type of data on. So yes, I believe those numbers are vastly underreported. Okay, gang, so what are we gonna do about that? <laughs> because as I said earlier, and as we get to our takeaways, you know. It's great for us to have this discussion. I've been trying to start an argument with somebody here, and everybody's being way too agreeable. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, we have to think about what's our action, what's our takeaway. Um, Representative Kendrick, I see you taking notes here, and uh, so on. Uh, any any things that come to mind to you to to help bolster the argument? And speaking to the mic, if you would. Yeah, I, you know, thinking back to the debate that we'd had previously, I, I really it came down to, I mean, I, trying to think back to the actual debate that took place on the floor. I didn't go through any committee I sat on, uh, but the, the conversation was uh, regarding whether it be a primary or a secondary offense, and you saw uh, maybe some you know, pro-Fourth Amendment individuals uh, 
saying, you know, making the argument that it shouldn't be a, a primary offense, uh, but also understanding that uh, primary, ha having it as a secondary offense, not being able to pull over an individual uh, for distracted driving would then, um, would then basically gut the legislation or critically weaken legislation. Um, you know, that was, we'd had that conversation on one side of the building and, and there was, uh, you know, there's a bill last year that was referred in the last week of legislative session uh, filed by uh, Representative Razor out of Kansas City. Uh, so that, I mean, referral in the last week of session isn't going to lead to uh, a bill being uh, passed in, in the final weeks of legislative session. So, you know, anything that, uh, again, people can do in the community uh, to, to raise awareness, uh, and there's, uh, whether it be, you know, make trips to the Capitol or, or email call, uh, reach out to elected officials is gonna be critical in the build up to the, the 2020 legislative session. I think that's a, that is a key takeaway. Uh, Rick, I see you nodding your head enthusiastically. Here. Yes, sir. Um, are you going to start an argument with me, or are you uh, going to agree? We'll, we'll wait till halftime to do okay, that. All right, but, all right, fair enough. Go ahead. But I, I do think it's interesting that we've talked a lot about uh, the outcomes of distractions. But I think it's sad. What we want to focus on is more of the cause. There's a term we've heard tossed around in pop culture called FOMO, the fear of missing out. And I think so much of this goes back to a true addiction that we have to not only cell phones, but this fear of being constantly connected that we've heard, a fear that we're going to miss an opportunity to be engaged or hear a conversation or that we put too many passengers in the car. So I think while we're having these discussions, it's absolutely key to focus on these touch points that we've mentioned, but not forget that this stems, I think, from a deeper issue. We have a program called Text Less, Live More that our students have engaged in, which not only disconnects and, and attacks the issue of distracted driving, but gets to that deeper issue of living more, living more uh, detached from those distractions that pull at our, our everyday lives. Uh, we get into the whole science of you know how these things are rewiring mm -hmm. people's brains, uh, and particularly for young people who haven't seen that there's a whole real world out there outside of the the screen. Can I, can I push back at that? Just for just yeah, for a second, please, please. I, I think that young people, particularly millennials and Gen Zers, get really banged up and hit on on the distraction issue. And certainly, working at Students Against Destructive Decisions, there's a lot of root cause in that. But I really appreciated Kevin's point uh, in mentioning the research that uh, we're in the show me state. And the irony is not lost on me that parents and other adults in our everyday lives are showing young people exactly what behaviors they expect behind the vehicle. So I think the show me state needs to remember that, as you said, sir, it's not just what I say, do as I do, too. Yeah, that's, uh, that's very good. Uh, Carlos, you know, this is kind of right up your alley. I mean, this is, this is what you do and, and so on. Tell us a little bit more about the research that, uh, that you're involved with that, that show that we are not good multitaskers. Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, um, uh, again, I work in the uh, Department of Civil Engineering. Uh, there's about uh, eight faculty here in Mizzou. Um, and Mizzou, as the, uh, both the State Research University and the Land Grant University, we, um, you know, we were supposed to serve the state uh, by producing the research, by investigating uh, these issues. Uh, and um, um, safety is a big part of our, our research portfolio. Uh, and the issue of distracted driving. So let me kind of talk through really quickly how, um, what kind of uh, tools, data uh, is available and how do we do investigations. Now when you hear statistics that, that hey, distracted driving, if you're distracted, driving distracted, uh, your chances of um, being involved in a crash increases 27 fold or different studies have estimated different uh, answers. Now wh where does that statistic come from? Uh, we talked a lot about uh, the crash reports. Uh, again, we appreciate the, the police um, community, the officers who actually followed and do the investigation after crashes. So we get that data from um, uh, about crashes. And we've also mentioned the problem behind that is sometimes uh, that data isn't complete uh, because um, people don't admit <laughs> that they were distracted. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, unless it's a very serious crash, uh, they don't have the authority to go ahead and ask for the records, to, uh, to uh, have the warrant to, to, to search for records. So, so uh, we have that one source of data. We, um, we also have a national study um, that's been going on for a while where, where we instrumented about 4,000 vehicles. It's called a naturalistic driving study where we actually observed 
uh, drivers volunteer. They, they, they agreed uh, to be involved with this study. And, um, and those drivers so over multiple months or a year uh, are involved in crashes. So we actually have the, the actual data of people being involved in crashes, we have the videos before uh, of what they were doing before they, they were involved in crashes. Uh, and so we have another a second uh, rich data source. Uh, we also uh, appreciate Kevin Gamble from State Farm mentioning that um, uh, many of the, the insurance industry or even the self providers themselves are very interested in this issue and they uh, administer surveys and ask their own uh, uh, users and, and, uh, uh, and many times uh, folks are, are very candid in the surveys uh, in admitting their, their use. Uh, and then we all have uh, a fourth uh, source of data, and that, that is with driving simulator. Uh, uh, Dr. Dyer uh, earlier mentioned that we have a driving simulator here in Mizzou where we can simulate driving under different conditions. And one of the conditions we, do, we can simulate is people distracting, texting, and driving while they're driving the simulator. Um, now, the, obviously, the consequence of distracted driving a simulator is not uh, very severe. Uh, maybe you hurt your feelings and you go off the road virtually or get involved in a virtual crash, uh, which, is, which is okay. But we can get that data and we can analyze. We have eye trackers. Uh, we have other psychophysiological measures where we can monitor closely what, how people behave when they're distracting, how, how, how their pupils look down and, and not look at the road and for how long they do that. So we have very precise measurements uh, and data. So when, when the panelists here um, cite these research results, uh, um, I just want to explain that they come from uh, actual empirical data research, where there's crash data, where there's survey data, um, where there's naturalistic driving data or simulator data. They are based on, on science uh, and data. Thank you. So we got a couple of questions. Um, there's an in inexpensive technology that exists to stop people from being distracted by your cell phones. Uh, in some cases, it's merely tossing the thing in the back seat and saying, okay, I'll, I'll just leave it there until I get to it. That's not much technology, that's behavior. But does anybody have any um, uh, insights on, on the technology that's available uh, that can help people to not spend so much time on their hardware? Frank, uh, you're nodding your head. Uh, I. I tell children all the time at the schools that I go to and the youth groups that I go to, uh, I tell them all the time that they're, they can put an app in their phone now um, that costs nothing. And um, it's drive apps to where even if um, you wanted to set it up to where certain people can call through, um, I tell them, okay, say your parents need to be able to get a hold of you at any time. Uh, put your parents in as people that can call through, but nobody else can. It'll just send a text message back to the other person that tells them that you're driving, can't speak at the moment. If, now, I say your parents can go ahead and call through, but you set it up with your parents. They know you're driving. They know you can't answer your phone right as at the moment. As a teen, I w that would be the last person I'd want to speak to, but that's an editorial comment. Well, uh, I, I tell them this for emergency situations because, as you see, my phone's here with me, and... Um, I'm never without it because six years ago I was without it and it took three and a, three and a half hours for them to tell me my daughter was dead. That's a, that's a blow that still hurts yeah, because right. there were thousands of people trying to get a hold of me literally and when I say that I literally had people around the world trying to contact me to let me know and um, all I had to do is have it so certain people could have got a hold of me. Sure. And so now I, I, I advocate that first, put a drive app in your phone, and second, have someone, whether it be your parent or your best friend, have someone that can contact you through. And they have a system set up. Your phone rings, oh, my mom's calling me. Well, if your phone rings three times, it's important. So you pull over to the side, you contact your mom, find that, out what's I, important. I think that's so, a key point, and again, this goes to those of us uh, who need sometimes to respond very quickly at NTSB, uh, our uh, response operations center uh, has all of our phone numbers. They know where, where to get a hold of us. And so if we're on go team, 
we have to answer the call, but we're driving whatever. You find a place to pull over. I've had this happen twice now, and it's not that hard to find some place safe to pull over, take the call, deal with the things. Uh, I don't multitask, none of us do, uh, and then get back to doing whatever else I was doing. So I think that's, uh, that's really important. Why aren't we pushing for more of these kinds of, of simple applications, simple solutions? Any observations there, panel or audience? Yes, Frank. Uh, excuse me, Doug. Well, the problem is they're all voluntary. Um, and so as we consider the state of distracted driving, um, in my role as a, as a safety advocate, um, I've de I develop communications programs, and this is what I've discovered. We can do all we can to educate, alert, um, influence, but a key takeaway, in my opinion, we need to begin to villainize distracted driving. We're treating this too softly. We're treating distracted drivers too softly. Once we villainize this, we did the same thing with um, drunk driving, didn't we? Why do we have so much success in drunk driving? Because we villainized it. The lawmakers are going to respond with the law when we villainize this activity. Until then, they're going to be arguing about primary or secondary. The public, safe drivers, previously safe drivers, are going to become dangerous drivers. Soccer moms, until we villainize the activity, we're too soft. Thank you. Uh, you're getting us into our next area, which we will get to in, in just a moment. There's another source of distraction out there. Um, anybody have a new vehicle, relatively new vehicle? Have you noticed that they have a lot more screens on it and levels and, and so on? And does anybody here, I think this is a rhetorical question, remember the radio with five push buttons on it to pre-select the station, and if it was really fancy, it had AM and FM. Did, the, did those work pretty well? Yeah, all it took was just a quick glance over and, and, and go from there. The challenge is, once we get beyond about three seconds, covering from the 20-yard line to the end zone, things start to get really, really bad. And uh, Carlos, you might have more information on that relative to the amount of time it takes to program a cell phone, write a text or something. But we've seen from some of the studies, when they get into uh, seven and eight seconds, which is not a very long time to be thumbing things, uh, that the, the potential for a crash goes way, way up. I, I, is that correct? Yeah, I, I, I think many people understand uh, the, the physics of, of uh, you know, when we are driving. I, I think everybody, one of the things that makes uh, uh, kind of a, um, our career as a transportation uh, engineer faculty uh, very interesting is because everybody thinks they're an expert because they are. In fact, everybody drives and they have the intuition. So they have the intuition uh, in terms of when, when they drive, they're driving at 70 miles per hour versus 25 miles per hour, that, that the perception reaction time uh, uh, involved, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a very short time uh, when, when you're driving faster, uh, on, on especially on, on some of our high-speed facilities. So, so I, I, that, I, I definitely agree, um, you know, when, when, uh, when we talk about three seconds, uh, it matters a lot if you're traveling 70 miles an hour um, down, down the freeway. Um, going back to your point about technology and also the, the kind of complexity of technology, so now we have not just the simple uh, buttons uh, or, or levers because the technology now involves menus and selections and, and scrolling and swiping and all sorts of things where uh, it's, not, it's more seconds added to, to even uh, uh, accessing whether it's the, the onboard computer or, or even our phones are, are, are being, uh, the, 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 the thing is with the, the advances in technology also can come 
with the possibility of technology getting more complicated. So, um, so that that's uh, kind of multi multiplicative. Yeah, we've, uh, we've seen the uh, complexities of technology in the aviation business, but I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole uh, here at the moment. Okay, thank you very much. I got it, I got it. Um, <laughs> all right, so, um, panel, you've done a, a great job. Thank you very much. Uh, we're gonna take about a 10 minute break, and then we're gonna come back and we're gonna talk about education, legislation and enforcement, and I think that's going to be one of our key things. And Nicholas, do you have anything to add? 10.30? Uh, okay, yeah, so 10.30, uh, everybody be back in your seats. We will start precisely at 10.30.